Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. Today's episode is a conversation I had with Kevin Postman, who's a senior research associate at Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Science. Kevin was a speaker at the 2022 Five Minute Genius Maine Science Festival event, and as much as I love that event, it was clear that Kevin had more projects that he could talk about. Luckily, he said yes when I asked him to be a guest here, and our conversation covers much more than five minutes, all of it interesting. I hope you enjoy it. Kevin, welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I am delighted to have you. You are a scientist at one of my favorite places in Maine, Bigelow Laboratory. One of my unending quests is to make sure that people know more about Bigelow Laboratory every day because so few people know what Bigelow Laboratory does. And I should say the whole thing just once, Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences. So that's a little bit of a preview for people. I would love to hear about how you got into science, You know, whether you were a young kid who caught the bug early or someone who was lucky enough to figure it out later in life, and then we'll dive into the work you do. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Kate. I guess I wasn't a scientist straight off the bat here. I was actually convinced I was going to be a civil engineer because I really liked building stuff. But I was fortunate enough in high school, we had an elective that was genetics. And so I took that and I was blown away. And so credit to Mrs. Carnes for getting me into genetics. And I was convinced I wanted to pursue that. And so I went to RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology, as a biotechnology major. And from there, it just kind of snowballed, I guess. <laughs> that is an amazing elective to have in high school. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was really fortunate. I um, assume you did more than like understanding the P experiment and the chromosomes. That yeah, no, you, you got to give Mendel in there, of course. Well, you yeah. got to start with that, but you don't have yeah. to end with that. <laughs> no, but it was, it was an overview. You know, there was some microbiology in there. And I think that's what I really keyed into because ultimately I became uh, pursued microbiology uh, in graduate school. So um, you've taken microbiology. How did you end up at Bigelow and how did Maine get lucky enough to get you? Yeah. So I I was from kind of Rochester, New York area and went to RIT. And then for graduate school, I went to Cornell. So it was very kind of Western New York centric there. And then I saw an opportunity at Bigelow Labs and it was different from the work I was doing, but it was much more in line with what I had become interested in. And that was more applied research on climate change and climate related issues. And so I saw Dr. Stephen Archer at Bigelow had a really interesting project about ocean acidification and biogeochemistry involved there. And so I happened to apply and was fortunate enough to be accepted. We're all better off for that, I think. I grew up in upstate New York, so I know exactly where you're talking about when you mentioned all those places. So I was lucky enough and people who went to the festival last year were lucky enough to hear you give a five minute genius talk on your work with Mosaic which was a really extraordinary project, I think. When I first heard about, oh yeah, research in the Arctic, I didn't fully appreciate the duration and the length of time and what you all had to do to make that happen. And I assume that that definitely is part of the climate change work you're doing. But if you could talk about that a little bit and then how you're building off of that, that would be really cool. Kind of that is, believe it or not, like kind of one vignette of the work that we're doing at Bigelow, and particularly in the Air Sea Lab and the group that I work with. So, as you mentioned, Kate, the mosaic was a very large, the largest of its kind, actually, international Arctic research project. And for those who may not have heard about it, it involved taking an icebreaker and freezing it into the ice for a year as we drifted across the Arctic, taking all kinds of measurements. And the way it worked was there were teams of scientists that were on. There were some, the whole journey was divided into legs and scientists stayed for, on average, I'd say two to three months, depending on the leg and the conditions. And there were about 100 people, 50 scientists, 50 crew on each leg and all manner of research. And I can talk a little bit about our stuff. Part of the Air-Sea Interaction Laboratory at Bigelow, and it, it is exactly as it sounds. So we're interested in the processes, particularly in the ocean, the biological processes that produce things like, for this project, gases like CO2, methane. And another one folks may not have heard about is DMS, dimethyl sulfide, which is a sulfur compound and it's produced biologically in the ocean and actually makes its way to the atmosphere is important for cloud formation. So it's a really interesting compound. And so what we were doing on Mosaic is that we built what's called a gas flux chamber And we were able to tote it around all over the ice on the open parts of the water and measure the gas fluxes of these three gases, methane, carbon dioxide, and DMS, because all these are very important, obviously, as folks may know as climate-related gases, and very important to kind of understand 
not only the, the magnitude of those fluxes in the Arctic, but the processes that contribute to their formation and how they may be changing as the Arctic is warming. And so this project, it was myself and Dr. Stephen Archer from Bigelow Labs, but we also were collaborating with folks from CU Boulder and out west. And we were on there every one of us was on there for every leg for the whole year. And uh, Steve did two. Another collaborator in our group, Byron, did three. So it was almost nine months out there. And yeah, I did one as well. Are all three of those chemicals that you're looking for, are they all a critical part of ocean acidification? No. So yeah, so I'm jumping around. I started the ocean acidification. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So carbon dioxide is the principal gas we you're, yeah. you're looking at for ocean acidification because of the chemistry as carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean water. Yeah. So methane is a potent greenhouse gas. and DMS, as I said, is important for cloud formation, which in the Arctic is aerosols because it's historically, you know, very clean air, aerosol free in the Arctic. So the production of aerosols is very interesting in that region. Is it different because of the temperature, the production of it? You said it's rarer. And I assume that part of that is because of the temperature of the Arctic is so different. Yeah. The ice coverage and lack of other biological to terrestrial environment. And then, yeah, the cold, very little water vapor and everything like that. So are you looking at those same three chemicals? You'd never know I have a chemistry degree the way I'm talking about this. <laughs> are you looking at those same three things in other parts of your work? And use this as an opportunity, please, to dive into any project you want to talk about. Oh, yeah. So the, certainly a, a dimethyl sulfide DMS is a through line for the work, you know, my work at Bigelow and Steve Archer's work there is his career as well. And so we've looked at that in the context of ocean acidification and other in other experiments in other regions of the ocean. And so that's the primary one. And then just in terms of the gas transport of CO2 and methane, that was new for our group for the Arctic. Typically, when we're doing DMS work, we're actually looking at the microbiology of the water as well as the production of DMS. So we're actually biogeochemists. I'm going to drop a new vocab word in here. I'm looking at the air-sea interaction. And so for DMS, the, the types of phytoplankton in the water is a very important marker for kind of DMS production. So why don't we dive into that? Why don't you explain what molecularly has to happen, what little critters have to be around for the production sure. of DMS, and then what increases or decreases in that is an indicator to you all? The simplest explanation is you'd say, like, to a larger extent, like microalgae and phytoplankton produce a parent compound called DMSP. And that is when those organisms die or are eaten, they release that into surrounding ocean water, and that is metabolized into DMS by bacteria. And then that is released into the water and then into the atmosphere. So if there is a lot of die-off in one of these plankton that has this photoplankton, then there'll be more DMS in the atmosphere. It can. There are other <laughs> feedbacks in there. You mean but, it's not so simple, Kevin? I can't do a one-to-one -one here? <laughs> not as simple, but in general, you <laughs> theory would be, yeah, yeah that those higher biomasses, those organisms containing more DMSP, it would be metabolized into DMS. But there are conditions that may not be the case. So what we're looking at, at like kind of a macro scale, so maybe you wouldn't think about it so much as like people would think of like a red tide or like kind of like a bloom bus system. There's just a natural kind of churn of this compound in the organisms in the ocean. For instance, the first experiment I referenced when we got here was we were able to use these large structures called mesocosms, which are basically these floating steel cages with a German group, GMR Helmholtz. We collaborated. This is off the coast of the Canary Islands. So you can moor those off the shore and you put these huge, about three meters wide and maybe 10 meters down plastic bags. And what the project was doing was acidifying these bags to the kind of projected levels that we're going to reach over the next several decades based on the current climate models of ocean acidification. And so you can say, this is a model ocean in 2030, 2040, 2050, 2100. And then so we would go through and kind of sample those organisms over the course of a month. And Steve and I were focused on looking at microorganisms involved in the DMSP and DMS production. And see, okay, if there's more acid oceans, right, is that changing the composition of the phytoplankton? Are the phytoplankton that usually making DMS and DMSP not making as much because it's acidified? 
And so that's kind of what we're looking at, that longer term kind of macro, I guess, force of oceanification. I have two questions. One is the animals that you're looking at, that you're modeling the different ocean acidification 10 years out, 20 years out, 30 years out. How fast do they evolve? Is that something that you have to have as a factor that you may or may not be able to attribute? Yeah, that's a real question because they were going from whatever the ocean was now and were just like bubbling CO2 and leaping them into 2100, right? There are ways to set up different controls, like in other untreated mesocosms of those experiments. And you could see like, what is just the artifact of being in the bag or being exposed to this kind of stuff? What is that doing to the community? But yeah, I think microbes themselves are pretty resilient. And so I think what we're looking for is what are the physiological adaptations that happen just over that period? And you would see the organisms that may be more adapted already to that kind of environment begin to dominate. If you're thinking of the whole ocean over time, what are the evolutionary forces and how is it going to look? This is obviously just an approximation. And I would imagine your head would explode trying to figure that out. Yeah, well, I mean, in one sense, we're already running that experiment. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, true. Uh, that sense, yeah, we're trying to get ahead of it here. <laughs> yeah. So it could be one physiological adaptation that maybe some individuals would just uh, get used to it over time through selection, or that there's just a population out there that in those kind of conditions would favor and then they would dominate. Yeah, I remember reading that there's been some research that has shown there's some corals. I don't want to say they're thriving, but they're doing fine with some of the warming waters. And it's like it's one species that has some type of adaptation or it's starting to take over because the waters aren't affecting them as badly as others. So it sounds like it's similar to that. Yeah, but I think it's important to note that in the span of what we're looking at, of like the geological time, the from the Industrial Revolution to now is a very rapid change. And so through that, historically been associated with large die-offs or a reduction of diversity for sure. Yeah, I wasn't trying to dismiss like, oh, microbes could just evolve quickly. I think it it is really important to realize that what we're doing is almost like the snap of a finger in the change in our environment. The other thing I realized as you and I were talking, we both may have a better understanding of why the acidification of the ocean is such a big deal. And maybe if you could explain a little bit about what the ocean has been like for a large part of geologic time, certainly within human lifespan, and then what this acidification means both for the ocean itself and then as a result for the people who are on the land, which, as Deb Bronk likes to remind me, is a much smaller proportion of the world than the ocean. So, (laughs) Yeah, so I guess I'll simply say the human civilization, human history, the ocean, and we'll say the acidity or the pH of the ocean has been extremely stable. It's like an enormous volume and it's very well, what we say, well buffered. I think people are more familiar with the warming aspect, but the acidification aspect is kind of a, the insidious twin of that. And that's as the CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere, the atmosphere and the ocean are kind of in an equilibrium, not only in heat, but also in the, these gas concentrations. And so the CO2 will dissolve into the ocean. And so what that does is that it increases the acidity, it lowers the pH of the ocean. Especially if you're looking at the pH scale, people might not get a sense of how big of a deal that is, but that's a logarithmic scale. So even, you know, single point changes are extremely big deal across an entire ocean. And what that kind of signals, there are a lot of organisms, we say like calcifying organisms, organisms that build shells that will be impacted by this chemical change. And it's one thing to think of you, like you take your lobster and you would put it in some like slightly more acidic water and it's like, it's no big deal. But that is an adult organism. And for the life cycle of some of these even larger organisms, the larval stages are very sensitive to these small changes. And so that's the macroorganism picture. There are a lot of microorganisms that also are calcified and would be impacted by these slight changes. So not only the warming, but the acidification is potentially altering major portions of the microbial food web that's going to have cascading effects all the way up. That's perfect. I really appreciate that. I'm going to circle back to the air ocean work that you all do. The ocean is so cool and enormously complicated to an outside observer who's thinking about the currents and different parts of the ocean that are impacted by different land masses around it, by the different water flowing into it. 
And then you add in the complication of the air and the atmosphere and the turbulence in there. How much are you able to figure out the two, the intersections of the two? We know that the atmosphere, here's a common sense example from someone who's just kind of observing. Storms have certainly gotten larger in the last 20 years. And a large majority of people attribute that to climate change and changes in the atmosphere. And I would imagine that those changes in the atmosphere will have some type of corresponding impact on the ocean as well. Is that the types of things that you're looking at with your work, or at least that you observe? No, uh, that is like several kind of scales above the work we're doing. That would be more of like, I think, physical oceanography or even like global systems type. And we do have collaborators that we work with that look at those things like on average, like would wind speeds be increasing or decreasing? And that in itself would facilitate more or less gas transfer between the ocean and the atmosphere. Or things like ocean heating, like is it changing these huge current cycles? Like famous example is like the Gulf Stream type of thing. Are these slowing down? Are they speeding up? Is the ocean becoming more stratified and then there's less mixing overall? And what our work does is I would say we are taking finer scale measurements and linking those kind of physical processes above gas transfer to hopefully the biological responsible agents in the ocean. And then we feed that information to modelers and earth system scientists that would then do that. Cloud formation is a really big deal on the planetary scale. And the oceans are, as you said, a huge portion of the surface of the ocean. So if we are finding that in these regions, there's perhaps less DMS being produced, that means less cloud formation, which means changes in precipitation patterns. It could also mean instead of a nice fluffy white surface that's reflecting solar radiation, you're now exposed to more dark blue that is absorbing more light. But that is outside of my expertise, I'll say. But what you're doing, it sounds like, is you're providing the scaffolding and the foundation so that the people who are building those things have a better understanding of what to take into account. Right. Yep. I mean, the empiricists and the modelers, you know, we're trying to bridge that divide. The whole common language thing has got to come into play here, right? Yeah, two, yeah. two disciplines separated by a common language and trying yeah. to... Some folks, you know, want to extrapolate. Some folks just want to get out there and measure it. See, but right. All right. So, what's your latest bit? Never a dull moment at Bigelow Laboratories or the the Air Sea Interaction Lab. That's for sure. I got to say, with the project that I've been working on, it's taking a lot of my time. Past few years is an exciting one, and it's actually born out of it's a nice success story of just looking at ocean processes and trying to understand nature and what's going on and how those kind of inquiries can lead to applied research. And so what we're working on right now is we're actually trying to develop an animal feed, a seaweed-based animal feed that you would give to cattle in particular, so cows, to help them reduce their methane production. I can square that circle for you, Kate, if you want. Oh, I know it, but I think you need to square it for everybody else. Right. <laughs> yeah, so we found, and, and folks have found this, but... Um, we're following on research here that seaweeds produce some compounds that are actually atmospherically relevant. So they're part of our, the whole air-sea interaction, but that are inhibitory to methane production. And maybe folks know, but there are a lot of cows and they produce a lot of methane, so much so that it's a serious contributor to methane production in the atmosphere. Folks may also know that methane on a shorter term basis, you can do different calculations, but it actually has more of a warming impact in a shorter amount of time. So one strategy that's it's hoped that's going to produce kind of a rapid intervention here would be reducing that methane as quickly as possible from the sources. It seems like a, I don't want to say easy, but maybe a, an obvious target would be the livestock industry here. And so we're hoping that, particularly from Midcoast Maine here, that we can couple not only the science here at Bigelow, but the aquaculture expertise of the region to use seaweed to increase the nutrition of animal feed and then also contribute to this methane reduction. I want to hear whatever you want to elaborate on with that. I'm curious where your part in particular comes in, because is it the seaweed production? Is it understanding? No, yeah. So what our skill set is, so we do a lot of chemistry, and so we're always detecting various compounds in water and the air. And so what we were able to do is screen seaweeds for how much of these antimethanogenic compounds they contain. We haven't brought the cows on premises yet. We don't have a farm out back at Bigelow. 
but we've actually partnered with some producers in the region. We've been able to reproduce kind of a cow rumen in experimental form in the lab. And we're able to measure the kind of methane and CO2 and stuff that we would in the field at the bench scale and test these seaweeds there in our little glass herd, we call it the bottle herd. That's awesome. We're doing screening and helping increase the production of these compounds and understand their stability and stuff like that. So are you working with seaweeds that are already part of aquaculture or ones that could be done relatively easily? Yeah, definitely. We're looking at things that are, there's already capacity in the scale. Um, We're kind of doing across the board and not just like people are thinking probably the macroalgae, the kelp, but potentially microalgae as well. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not trading one environmental problem for the other because the scale of this animal feed would be huge. So we're making sure that we're picking things that could be scaled sustainably. I don't even know if you can answer this question, but is there any concern that the cows won't want to eat this? In some of the animal trials, there's a phase just called palatability. So I'm a microbiologist, kind of more of a chemist here in the ocean. So I'm going to learn a lot about cows very soon and what they like and what they don't like. Maybe they're not as discriminate as I'm giving them credit for. I don't know. I've actually heard that they are. They can be quite picky. So that might be a challenge, but there are all different ways to kind of mix it in. And I was thinking maybe it's a little salty or like a little funky. I will say this is a particular problem. We're kind of dancing around this, but from my understanding with cows, because they are ruminants, because they have multiple stomachs and the way that their digestion works, and they are belching out for the most part, a literal ton of methane. I mean, yeah. that's where the issue comes from. That's right. I mean, it's hard to believe, you know, I did not appreciate how big cows are. They're enormous. And they're ruminants, as you said, you know, the microbiologist in me is just in awe because the rumen is just a plant. It's like a cellulose degrader. And the way that these animals can get so big just by eating grass is a testament to the amazing microbiology that's going on in the room and the amazing chemistry there. And then, yeah, the methane part we're hoping is kind of a almost, I mean, I guess it'd be hubris to say just a waste process because you know, this may have been selected over <laughs> millions of years of evolution, but one that we think that if we can get a handle on and tamp it down would actually contribute more energy back to the cow. And so there's not only the benefit of reducing the amount of methane produced, but we're hoping that the feed as well would enhance the nutrition for the cow. For that's the super body. interesting that it might end up being a real benefit. Yeah, that's the hope. Even directly through the suppression of that process or through, because seaweeds come with all sorts of other nutrients that may not as easily be available with terrestrial plants or traditional feeds. I'm going to hazard a guess there's not a single person at Bigelow who had on their bingo card, we are going to work with cows. Five, six years ago. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It would be interesting. All roads go back there. I don't know. No. Well, I don't know. You know, you are an ocean laboratory that yeah. has made its name, I think, in really extraordinary ocean science. It's not an yeah. obvious connection that you go back to agriculture no, and land. Definitely not. Um, it does raise an eyebrow at first when you bring it up to people. They're like, what? And then you have to explain the seaweed connection, the ocean chemistry connection. and then yeah. It's funny because it's not a quick fix or an easy fix for climate change, but it's something that could conceivably be much faster than many of the other solutions that we know are out there. So there's that. But yeah. I also think this project is so deeply reliant on a pretty extensive set of knowledge that Maine has in different areas, right? There's yeah. the microbiology part. And then you tie it in with the seaweed and the oceans and what works best there. And then there's agriculture aspects. I mean, it's almost this wonderful little sweet spot where a really diverse group of people get to get together to tackle this problem. That's the kind of group we're going to need to tackle some really interesting problems, but it also fosters some really innovative ideas in other ways. Absolutely. Well, it's been wonderful to partner with seaweed producers here in Maine and farms here in Maine. And seeing this collaboration grow now is kind of us and Maine kind of leading the way in a sense. It's really cool. That's really great. Do you have any other projects or is that one taking up? And I'm not fishing. I think you were (laughs) already. We've now been to the Arctic and we've done seaweed and. (laughs) Yeah. I know that we did ocean acidification. Yeah. We've hit a lot here. (laughs) Yeah. It turns out, and this is really a credit to Steve Archer and his vision here, the breadth of the science we do in the air sea interaction lab and Bigelow as a whole turns out there's a lot of air and sea interaction and you can go a lot of different directions with that we can have a whole other conversation we'll read about it you know follow up 
Yeah, there's so much going on, not just in the lab, but uh, I shouldn't say just the air sea lab, but Bigelow lab as a whole. I wasn't saying it's one of my favorite places, just a butter yeah. <laughs> I mean, I adore the work happening at Bigelow. I think one of the biggest unfortunate things that has happened is that an awful lot of people in Maine don't know about the work y'all do. And it's hard because microbial stuff, it's hard to visualize, right? Yeah. It's not, you don't have pretty pictures. Volcano people or volcanists <laughs> are the best, right? Like they have the best easy communication to get the word out in, in many yeah. ways. I got to give credit to the, there have been some great kind of collaborations with artists and the communication team at Bigelow, I think does a really good job. And so I totally agree. Punching above yeah. our weight. But yeah, it is. We're kind of, you know, we're out there in East Booth Bay. So it's not something you're usually just driving by. So do you have a preference personally about whether you would do something like go on, be stuck in an icebreaker for three months or go <laughs> muck around with the cows? Or do you really enjoy the opportunity to mix it up and have these different things? No, to do? I, I mean, I think I do enjoy the different types of not only bench work and field work, but the, as we were talking about the collaborations. And it's great because I feel like we're always learning something new and we're always kind of like pushing ourselves into a new area, which is, I think, pretty unique. But yeah, I mean, something like the icebreaker and that's like kind of an incredible once in a lifetime thing. No, I don't know. I mean, the kind of the work in the Canary Islands, you know, it was, uh, that was really nice, more tropical as well. Maybe that would be my preference. No, yeah, would, you really are hitting all the environments here. <laughs> yeah, I, would go, I would go back to either anytime. I don't know. I'm always a sucker for cows and their pastoral look and how content they always seem in the fields. This has been a really great conversation. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your work too. I think no one else gets to see these videos. We just do Zoom because it's an easier conversation, but your face has been lit up this whole time talking. And so <laughs> I have to figure out a way to convey that. This has been really great. Cool. Great. I hope folks enjoy it. I hope so too. Thanks for listening to the Main Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on your podcast platform of choice. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios at the Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is executive produced and hosted by me, Kate Dickerson, and edited and produced by Scott Lozell. The Discover Maine theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.